Reminders to all our attendees of the 12th Pagina Symposium. Before we get started, if you have any questions during any of the presentations, please feel free to type in your questions in the chat box and our speakers will answer them in the chat box. Or you can personally send us a message at tslhrd by simple at gmail.com. A friendly reminder to all our participants that microphones are muted by default during the entire presentation. And please kindly answer the evaluation form after the last speaker of the session and link will be seen in the chat box. CPD units will be provided and your e-certificate will be issued through your email within two weeks. Thank you for being part of the success of this biennial symposium. Now we move on to our next speaker. She completed her fellowship training in adult pulmonary and critical care medicine at the Philippine Heart Center. She is a fellow of the Philippine College of Physicians, Philippine Society of Critical Care Medicine, and a fellow of the Philippine College of Test Physicians. She was previously the training officer and the past chairman in the Department of Internal Medicine in San Pablo Hospital in Davao. She is the past vice president of the PCCP Southern Mindanao Chapter and a member of the Philippine Foundation for Lung Health Research and Development. Let us all welcome our ever dynamic Dr. Christina Uy to talk on the high flow nasal cannula. Flash in front of you are the objectives of her lecture. So good afternoon. This session, we will be discussing high flow nasal cannula with the following objectives. The, we will discuss the role of high flow nasal cannula in addressing hypoxemia, enumerate its indication, contraindication, and limitation, and possible complications. And we will also provide the basic guides on how to initiate and modify high flow nasal cannula setup. So most of the oxygen delivery devices that we often see in the world are those of the low flow and the intermediate flow system. This slide shows us the different devices and their corresponding flow rate and FiO2. The FiO2 range from 25 to 95% and the flow rate range from one to at most 15 liters per minute. Only the high flow nasal cannula can provide a flow rate up to 60 liters per minute and an FiO2 that range from 21 to 100%. This is a basic setup for high flow nasal cannula. An air oxygen blender allowing an FiO2 of 21% to 100% and generating up to six liters per minute flow. The gas is heated and humidified through an active heated humidifier and is delivered by a single limb heated inspiratory circuit. This one. The patient then breathes adequately through the heated and humidified nasal gas through the large diameter nasal cannula. So what are the mechanisms of clinical benefit of HFNC? So this table will show us the different mechanism of high flow nasal cannula and its physiologic and clinical benefit. First, it has a small pliable nasal prong. So this, in contrast to the tight fitting mass of the non-invasive ventilation, can improve patient's comfort and as well prevent or have skin, less skin damage. Second, warming and humidification of airway. During a spontaneous or natural breathing, inspired air passes through the nose, pharynx, larynx, and trachea. This part of the airway is able to warm and humidify inspired air all the way down to the alveoli. The inspired air is then warmed up to body temperature and is fully saturated with water vapor. There are also excellent radiators. Even when the ambient air is cold and dry, they are capable of maintaining temperature in the oropharyngeal area. So here. However, when supplemental oxygen is used, these are not usually humidified when administered at low flow. Poor 
or dry humidified medical gas may elicit complaints like the dry nose, dry mouth, nasal pain, and may result in poor tolerance to oxygen therapy. Unconditioned gas increases airway resistance to protect the lungs from the dry, cold, inspired air by reducing airflow to the upper airways and trachea. So breathing dry air is also known to reduce nasal mucociliary clearance. So warming inspired oxygen and heating it to the core temperature is more effective at high flow rate, we often see in high flow nasal cannula. At optimum temperature of 37 degrees centigrade with a flow in the range of 20 to 60 liters per minute, a 100% humidification is achieved and maintained constant. With this increased humidification, it will lead to increased water content in the mucus, facilitating removal of secretions, decreased work of breathing, and avoid airway desiccation and epithelial injury. An anatomical dead space refers to the volume of air located in the segments of the respiratory tract responsible for conducting air to the alveoli and respiratory bronchioles. These do not take part in the process of gas exchange itself. It comprises approximately 30% of the tidal volume. So delivery of such a large amount of oxygen you will cause washout of the upper airway, the dead space, improving the efficacy of ventilation and enhance oxygen delivery and also carbon dioxide clearance, resulting to decrease in the work of breathing and respiratory rate. Improved washout with high flow nasal cannula permits higher fraction of minute ventilation to participate in alveolar gas exchange. So for this, the patient in your lab, he is inhaling low flow oxygen delivered by nasal cannula. This cannot wash out the anatomic dead space. However, when high flow nasal cannula is administered to the patient on your right, the delivery of large amount of oxygen tends to wash out the upper airway dead space. So here is it, improving the efficacy of oxygenation, enhancing the oxygen delivery, as well as the carbon dioxide clearance, and this will result in decreased work of breathing and respiratory rate. High flow will also increase nasopharyngeal pressure as the flow rate is increased. So when you breathe with your mouth closed, the maximum flow rate of 60 liters per minute can cause the nasopharyngeal pressure to increase up to 3 cm water. With your mouth open, with a maximum flow rate of 60 liters per minute, the nasopharyngeal pressure is lower than 3 cm water. The patient on your left is breathing low flow oxygen, and this will result in a smaller lung during expiration compared to that, to that patient who is receiving high flow nasal can on your right. So you see the higher flow rate will cause an increase in the functional residual capacity and it will increase by 25%. This positive pressure, although small, is sufficient to increase the end expiratory lung volume in a linear fashion with increasing gas flow. So what are the advantages of having a positive end expiratory pressure effect? This can unload the auto -peep it can decrease the work of breathing and enhance oxygenation in patients with alveolar feeling diseases such as those with congestive heart failure and acute respiratory distress syndrome. Patient in respiratory distress generates high inspiratory flow rate that exceeds the flow rate of a standard oxygen equipment. So we often see patients hyperventilating with an increased RR. So when the patient inspired at a higher inspiratory flow, also the room air that surrounds it will also go in when the patient is in a low flow nasal cannula. However, in a patient who is breathing with high flow nasal cannula, the oxygen is delivered at a high, much higher flow 
limiting the amount of room air that goes with it. So the end result will be minimal room air entrainment and greater oxygen delivery. With high flow nasal cannula, the flow is high and constant, overcoming gas dilution and maintaining the FiO2 constant. High flow rate will cause improved breathing pattern and increasing the tidal volume and decreasing the respiratory rate. So what are the indications for high flow nasal can? Acute hypoxemic respiratory failure is one of the common indication for high flow nasal can. This may be caused by various diseases such as pneumonia, interstitial diseases, pulmonary edema. It will improve oxygen without affecting the carbon dioxide and it will reduce the respiratory rate and clinical signs of distress. Hence, the patient will have better comfort. Now, the goal of this high flow nasal can used in patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure is to avoid escalation to a more advanced respiratory support, such as a non invasive ventilation or endotracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation. Several studies comparing the high flow nasal can with the conventional old oxygen therapy or non-invasive ventilation, and this includes variable cases, including those in the emergency room. So the outcome they measured include the re-intubation rate, the 90-day mortality, co-patient's comfort, patient's respiratory rate, and the saturation. So here are some of the examples of the study, which include the floral trial. This compares high flow nasal cannula with conventional oxygen therapy or non-invasive ventilation among hypoxemic patients with a PF ratio of less than 300 and a respiratory rate more than 25 with a normal PaCO2. The results have shown fewer intubation and lower 90-day mortality rate in those receiving high flow nasal can. This table also showed trials involving patients at the emergency room and those immunocompromised patients, which showed fewer intubation rate among those receiving high flow. Other studies showed no difference between the high flow and the rest. So signs that portend the need for mechanical ventilation among these patients in the trials include persistently high respiratory rate, ongoing hypoxemia, thoracoabdominal asynchrony, and the presence of non-pulmonary organ failure. However, none of these signs can reliably identify patients who should be intubated. Roca and colleagues made an attempt to identify these patients who will likely require mechanical ventilation by developing a clinical index we know as ROCS index. This is a ratio of the O2 saturation over FiO2 to respiratory rate. This is used in patients with respiratory failures secondary to pneumonia. So the results have shown that if the ROCS index is more than 4.88 after 12 hours on high flow nasal can, the patient is unlikely to need mechanical ventilation. However, it is unclear if it can be used with other causes of hypoxemia, and it cannot be used to predict outcomes before 12 hours. High flow nasal can is also a good alternative means of supplementing oxygen among patients with acute heart failure. So here are two of the studies the Rotka et al., which shows that high flow nasal cannula decreased inspiratory collapse of the inferior vena cava among patients with New York Heart Classification 3 heart failure. And Moriyama et al. reported successful maintenance of oxygen in patients with life-threatening reperfusion pulmonary edema using the high-flow nasal cannula. Another indication is preventing re-intubation. So when high flow nasal cannula with a 50 liters per minute was applied 48 hours post-extubation, 
among patients who passed the spontaneous breathing trial, but the PF ratio is less than 300, it has been shown to reduce non-invasive ventilation and re-intubation. This also improves secretion clearance, prevented hypoxemia, lowering of the respiratory rate, PACO2, and dyspnea score. So they also identified who among them are high risk for re-intubation. One, the patient age 65 years and above, with one of the following, heart failure as a primary indication, moderate to severe COPD, a patch score of more than 12, a BMI index of more than 30 kilograms square meter, those with limited air patency, those with inability to manage secretion, those with more than two comorbidities, and those with mechanical ventilation for more than seven days. Another indication are those with post-operative respiratory failure. So here we refer to surgical patients who underwent cardiothoracic surgery, abdominal surgery, and lung resection. So in these studies, high-flow nasal cannula was pitted against conventional oxygen therapy and non-invasive ventilation. And they measured outcomes such as PF ratio, presence of atelectasis, mortality, and re-intubation rate. So here is a list of the studies done on post-operative patients who underwent or undergone respiratory failure. So most of the studies showed no significant difference between high-flow nasal can against conventional oxygen therapy and non-invasive ventilation. Another indication would be the pre in pre-oxygenation and apneic oxygenation for patients who will undergo intubation. So oftentimes during intubation, we often use masks, the non-invasive face mask or the non-rebreather mask to give oxygen or provide oxygen during uh, intubation. However, this must be removed before we insert the laryngoscope. And sometimes high flow nasal cannula delivers oxygen in both phases of intubation. Another indication would be bronchoscopy. So during bronchoscopy, respiratory drive and mechanics are altered due to sedation and partial occlusion of the airway with the bronchoscope. Sometimes the so 2 saturation may fall to less than 90% despite oxygen. Another in indication will be hypercapnic respiratory failure. And this group of patients, they are considered uns unsuitable for mechanical ventilation. So the primary modality for such patient would be the non-invasive ventilation. However, the setback for NIV would be the tight fitting mask, which oftentimes is not tolerated by the patient. So high flow nasal cannula has been applied for those who are unable to tolerate non-invasive ventilation. And it has noted to provide the benefit of PIP and increased O2 saturation and increased comfort and compliance. So most of these studies were done on COPD patients who were both stable and those in exacerbation. And they also found out that gold stage three and four COPD patients High flow nasal can, given at more than 30 liters per minute, has decreased the respiratory rate, inspiratory time to total breath time ratio, diaphragmatic work of breathing compared to the non invasive ventilation. In some journals, obstructive sleep apnea has also been included as the indication for high flow nasal cannula. OSA is attributed to airway collapse associated with intermittent hypoxemia, neurocognitive dysfunction, and cardiovascular morbidity. So the most effective treatment for OSA patient is the continuous positive airway pressure. However, McKinley et al. reported that high flow nasal cannula elevates upper airway obstruction and can reduce arousal and apnea hypopnea index ratings. Lastly, 
one of the indication also include those patients who are on do not intubate status. So this is an effective alternative to the non-invasive ventilation. So in the study by Peters et al., no, they apply high-flow nasal cannula to 50 patients who are on the DNR status with hypoxemic respiratory failure. So only nine out of that 50 patient or 18% were escalated to non-invasive ventilation. And 82% or 41 out of the 50 patients were maintained on high-flow nasal cannula at a median duration of 30 hours. We will now be discussing the contraindication for high-flow nasal cannula. So these are the three contraindications. One is when you have abnormalities or surgery to the face, nose, and airway. And upper airway surgery can cause high pressure given by, uh, administered by the high-flow nasal cannula, which may precipitate venous thromboembolism. Another contraindication are those patients with facial trauma. So as for limitations and possible complications of high-flow nasal cannula, delayed intubation may worsen the prognosis for patients treated with high-flow nasal cannula. And patients with resp uh, respiratory or hemodynamic parameters, they are usually improved within one hour of the high flow. So predictors for treatment failure, failure of the respiratory rate to decrease, poor oxygen saturation, and persisting thoracoabdominal asymptony. For the complications, they include abdominal distension, and this is related to the flow rate and or incompetent esophageal sphincter tone. Another would be barotrauma. So sometimes we see patients who develop pneumothorax or pneumomegastinum after a course of high flow nasal cannula. And this is related to flow rate or air trapping or air leaks. And lastly, there is also, you also cause delay in endotracheal intubation and its sequelae. As for initiation and subsequent modification of the high flow nasal cannula setup, there are only two parameters that need to be set the flow rate between 20 to 60 liters per minute and the FiO2 between 21 to 100%. As mentioned in the previous slides, the ideal temperature to be set is 37 degrees centigrade. First, set the flow rate about 20 to 35 liters per minute, then adjust the FiO2 21 to 100%, targeting the desired peripheral O2 sat that you want. Now, flow rate can be increased at an increment of five to 10 liters if the RR fails to improve, oxygenation fails to improve, and breathing remains labored. Increasing the flow rate and FiO2 will both result to improve peripheral oxygen saturation. It is preferable to maximize the flow rate first to keep the FiO2 equal or less than 60%. However, there are times that it is necessary to increase the FiO2. So high flow nasal cannula is generally well tolerated and can be administered for prolonged periods like this. Patient can be switched to low flow nasal cannula once the flow rate is less than or equal to 20 liters per minute and the FiO2 is equal to or less than 50%. If you want to give aerolized medication, this is given to patients with high flow nasal cannula using an oral mouthpiece. So this is the end of the lecture. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you so much, Dr. Cecina Uy, for the brief and informative lecture on high flow nasal cannula. So as a way of our appreciation, the Philippine Foundation for Lung Health Research and Development, in cooperation with the Philippine Heart Center, Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care, we would like to show our gratitude and present our certificate of appreciation to Dr. Cecina Uy as a speaker and imparting her knowledge on 
the high flow nasal cannula during the 12th biennial symposium today, September 15, 2021, signed by our president, Dr. Cesar Ligo, Dr. Eileen Guzman Banzon, the head of the Division of Pulmonary Physical Care Med Medicine, and the members of the organizing committee. With that, we would like to thank our speakers for imparting their knowledge and to our audience, we appreciate your time and for being with us today. And we would like to invite you to the Boringer Ingelheim Dinner Symposium after the last session.